Good evening to all of you and welcome to the sixth day of the add-on course on gender studies. Before we begin our session for today, on behalf of the department, I would like to welcome Ma'am Jana Chaudhary, research person for today. At the same time, I would also like to give a short introduction about her. Currently, she is pursuing her PhD from the prestigious Tishpur University. Her areas of interest include grotesque bodies, body studies, contemporary fiction, etc. Her area of interest, areas of interest speak for itself that we are going to have a productive, wonderful session in connection with the course. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your presence and welcome to the add-on course and welcome to the English department of HPB Girls College as well. Thank you. And without much further ado, I would like to hand over this session to you, ma'am. It is over okay. to you, ma'am. Okay. I'm extremely glad to be a part of this gender studies add-on course. So uh, the first thing I would like to say is that I'll be sharing my um, presentation here. So I'll share my screen and just let me know if my voice is audible and if uh, there is any doubt or if I'm going too fast or slow, just uh, let me know. Okay, ma'am, you're audible now. Okay. Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. So um, I'm assigned to discuss this particular poem by Sappho. It's called One Girl. Uh, before starting with this poet, Sappho, what I would like to say is our perspective towards this poet. Uh, she is someone who has been constantly recovered over history. Because uh, like most of the antiquity poets, Greek antiquity poets, or most of uh, the, you know, Persian kings and uh, some of the, you know, uh, people who have been lost in history, Sappho is one such poet about whom uh, the Sappho scholars have been constantly reviving and recovering her text. Because we find Sappho in constant erasure. Most of her historical documents, most of her texts have been, uh, you know, burned or somewhere it has been lost over the years. So it is a recovery. And her poems exist as fragments. Uh, one girl is one such fragment. Uh, there is another name for this poem. It is called 105A. Uh, so this poem, it is translated, as we know, by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And uh, the same poem, 105A, has been translated over the years by many poets. So obviously, there would be a, a difference in all the translations. So first, let me start with a brief note on the poet. Her um, birth time period and her death time period has been considered to be somewhere between 630 to 7, uh, 570 BCE, which is again uh, in doubt. Uh, many scholars, uh, they constantly kind of debate about this particular time period. Uh, she belonged to a small island called Lesbos in Greece, and she belonged to an aristocratic family, married and had a daughter, and also she was exiled twice to Sicily for her political views. Then second thing which is important about this poet is her use of lyric poetry. Uh, lyric poetry, um, it, it means something that can be sung, a poem which can be sung, and sung in wedding ceremonies, uh, something like personal love poems, private prayers, and these fragments of Sappho is commonly known as the Sapphic fragments. So we will be dealing with one such fragment that is 105A, also known as One Girl, and that particular fragment is called Sapphic fragment. Uh, lyric has also been explored in other countries and other regions. Like in Rome, we have Homer, we have Catullus. Then in 10th century Persia, we have uh, poets like Hafiz. We have poets like uh, Amir Khushra, 
who also uh, wrote poems which could be sung. And also in India, we have a bhajans like um, something that is written by uh, Kalidas, Surdas, Kabir, etc. So um, Sappho was commonly known as the poetess. And she wrote in a dialect called the Aeolic dialect. And most of her works have been retrieved from the Aeolic dialect and translated into uh, you know, English and also other languages. So Sappho is not only a poet, but she is believed to be associated with music. Uh, the invention of the pectus or the harp, the plectrum, and one of the Greek musical modes called the mixolydian. Uh, just like you see in India, we have this tradition uh, which Kabir and other poets, um, you know, they have propagated the lyric poetry, something that Mirabai has uh, kind of propagated. In lyric poetry, what we see is that a poet would have her songs and she would play the, um, her or his songs and uh, they would play the songs with a particular instrument. We had uh, the dotora or the iktara with them, with uh, Mirabai and Kabir, etc. And then Sappho had her own pectus, harp, plectrum, etc. Then um, the next thing is that Sappho, along with uh, the contemporary poet Alcaeus, uh, they came up with this particular stanza called the Sephic uh, Handeka syllabic stanza. So this Sephic Handeka syllabic stanza is also known as the Sephix. Um, with an S, a plural suffix, and uh, which I would explain later in the other, you know, uh, slide. Uh, Sappho is known to have written nine volumes together, but uh, we see that only one particular volume has been discovered so far, and the rest remain in fragments. As far as her songs are concerned, most of the work has been displaced, and some has uh, never been, you know, uh, recovered at all. So Sappho is known to have popularized the word sapphic and the word lesbian. So uh, traditionally or during her time, uh, someone who lived in the geographical location of Lesbos uh, was considered to be a lesbian. But in the as we see the semantics developed and the ontology of the term developed, the modern meaning indicates something related to homosexuality or same sex female relationship. So, these are some of the things, uh, important things about Sappho. The next thing is Sappho and her circle. So the idea of having a circle of poets, having a circle of friends, or having a circle to discuss with uh, is comparatively modern because um, uh, we have the Bloomsbury group in, uh, you know, in, in history. We have uh, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood group of which the translator of this poem, uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, is a part of. So Sappho likewise had a particular group and she uh, was said to have taught ma unmarried women, you know, uh, people who were interested in art and skills. So she maintained a particular uh, group of such women and she would rather guide them towards uh, their, uh, you know, uh, adulthood, towards marriage, towards pursuing careers, etc. So in her circle, she would refer to her partners or she would refer to um, her uh, companions as, uh, you know, uh, refer to her groups as companions, children, or girls. So these were the terms that she referred to. And in most of the um, works of Sappho, we have some poems which are dedicated to her companions, some poems dedicated to her children or girls. So as far as her relationship with those people are concerned, it is not very clear. So. Um, everything about Sappho is in constant doubt, it is unreliable, and it is dubious. If you uh, search on the internet also, you would find too many materials on Sappho, but regarding the sources, there are very few. So we understand Sappho in constant interpretation and misinterpretations. Uh, regarding her death, what we see is that there is no clarity again. Alexander Pope in his poem Sappho, which has a small p, Sappho to Fion, uh, talks about the death of Sappho. And uh, there is a constant mystery involved in this death as well. It is said that she jumped off from a cliff, which is called the Leucadian Leap in many, uh, you know, uh, by many scholars, the Leucadian Leap. She jumped off from a cliff because she fell in love with a ferryman called Feon. And uh, Feon never responded to her love. So she decided to jump off from the cliff. 
but many people they also kind of contest this view and say that uh, there has been um, you know there have been a constant effort of trying to relate sappho to the image of aphrodite who was very mm, love broken heart broken after the death of her lover so there is a comparison that is given and also some people say that this is uh, why uh, you know this myth of sappho's death has been constructed because she openly talked about uh, sexual uh, sexuality of women about female choices and she gave strong political opinions so uh, a, a women at at her uh, you know at, uh, living during her time would definitely deserve a death like that would uh, jump off from a cliff and die so this is the entire death episode of sappho is very debatable so as her life is uh, erica young's uh, novel sappho's leap talks about you know uh, the death of sappho in a very different light uh, she, uh, the 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 uh, author says that sappho fell down from the cliff and instead of dying she kind of uh, you know lived happily ever after and then she also fell in love with the poet alcaeus and you know she had grandchildren and so she kind of goes along with the alternative narrative about sappho's life so when we talk about this poet it is important to understand uh, that uh, her social context would uh, actually explain more um, you know uh, regarding the uh, fragments that she has written over the years because uh, if we if we isolate the fragments uh, and we kind of remove her life altogether what we find is that the fragments are uh, they do not stand alone uh, we need sappho's life we need to understand um, her, the history of her life and more of a um, kind of a you know um, history of the writer's life is necessary here because the fragments are yeah, kind of very dismembered in nature okay so this is all i have to say about the poet now let's move on to the poem so this particular poem one girl uh, translated by dante gabriel rossetti and i constantly am uh, stressing on this translation part because uh, because it has been translated by many many you know translators which we will deal with later on so first let's read the poem and let's understand the uh, the content of it so like the sweet apple which reddens upon the topmost bar a top on the topmost twig which the pluckers forgot somehow forget it not nay but got it not for none could get it till now part 2 like the wild hyacinth flower which on the hills is found which the passing feet of the shepherds forever tear and wound until the purple blossom is trodden in the ground so this is the poem the first thing that we need to know about this poem is that uh, it is very short very brief that means it is a fragment there must have been lines that go uh, you know somewhere above it lines that might have been somewhere below it so it is in uh, in 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 kind of a enjambment kind of a form okay first let's notice the rhyme scheme it's bow somehow now that is a a a found wound ground b b b so i have highlighted this rhyme scheme um first critically understanding uh, first the textual reading then we will critically go into the poem's meanings like the sweet apple which reddens upon the topmost bough a top on the topmost twig means an apple which is growing on a tree it is reddening it is red in color and it is growing on the topmost branch on the topmost twig above the topmost twig so bough means branch and a top means above so like the sweet red apple which is growing on the topmost branch on the topmost twig of a particular apple tree which the pluckers forgot somehow so let's imagine that we are standing in a garden and the pluckers the gatherers the apple pickers they somehow forgot it forgot forget it not nay again constantly contradicting it that the gatherers forgot it or uh, perhaps the gatherers did not forget it no nay means no but got it not for none could get it till now but saying that the gatherers could not reach it because it was in such a height that the gatherers could not reach the apple very simple uh, an apple is growing on top of a tree it is in a particular height 
So the gamblers, the pickers, they might, uh, they might have not been able to reach the apple. At first, we think that uh, the gatherers forgot the apple. Then we get to know that no, the gatherers could not reach the apple. So this is the first, um, first part of the poem. The second part says that, like the wild hyacinth flower, which on the hills is found, like a wild flower, hyacinth flower, which is found on the hill, hill, which the passing feet of the shepherds are ever dear in wind. So on the hilltop, the shepherds are passing, they are coming and going, and they are constantly walking over the hyacinth flower. So this hyacinth flower, what happens is getting crushed on the ground until the purple blossom is trodden in the ground. So the Hayakin flower is getting crushed on the ground. As simple as that. First image is the apple, the sweet apple, which is growing on top of a tree. And the second image is the Hayasin flower, which is getting crushed. First image talks about an apple which you cannot reach, which you cannot crush, which you cannot threaten or eat or perhaps, uh, you know, pluck and throw on the ground. And the second is a hyacinth flower, which is on the ground and it is so readily available that you can immediately, you know, annihilate it. You can uh, cause problems, you can cause uh, death to that flower. So these two fragments, they stand like black and white to each other. So they are in a const uh, they are uh, very dialogic. They are in a dialogue. So if you consider the first uh, first uh, uh, first fragment. What you see is that it is very um, feminist in the sense that if you compare the apple to a woman, you see that the apple can readily stand for a female uh, you know, person, a female uh, being who is so, who, whose, whose position, whose stature uh, in terms of career, in terms of personality, in terms of uh, kind of in, in, in different fe uh, feats of um, skills and art is so high that you cannot reach that person, you cannot crush that person. And even in terms of marriage, suppose you cannot reach that person, you have, uh, you cannot even forget that person, that a person is high up located in the pedestal. And the second part is about a hyacinth flower. That means the expectation from that person. The expectation is that you expect the society, you expect the patriarchal society to come and crush that flower, annihilate that flower. But what happens is that the otherwise, the flower or the apple stands on top and you can never reach that particular, you know, a standpoint. You can never reach that particular location of the apple. So the sweet apple, the sweetness, the word sweet here means the sweet temperament of a Greek wife. Apple, apple can stand for something very, uh, you know, um, uh, like, like fruit and landscape, it has always been compared to the feminine. So apple here stands for the women. And then reddens, reddens means modesty. So every word would imply something or the other thing in this particular uh, poem. So first, this commentary is given by Cyrenus. The commentary by Cyrenus has led scholars to consider this fragment as a wedding song. The metaphor of the apple relates to the bride through firmness, seeds, and sweetness, the former illusions represent fertility, as firmness is indicative of a woman's body, and seeds represent the children she will bear of, uh, for her husband, while sweetness represent a woman's temperament that she must possess in her marriage. As such, Sappho's reference to a sweet apple denotes the young woman's maturity and desirability as a bride praising her for such qualities and emphasizing the bride's importance in a marriage. So what we see is that uh, this particular fragment, it is not overtly or very uh, kind of strongly feminist in nature. No, uh, it is not uh, kind of very uh, homoerotic in nature. No, it is mostly about the position of a bride or a position of a woman. It's telling the different kind of positions one girl can occupy in a society. So this is a very simple, uh, you know, fragment, but at the same time, it has some uh, Latin meanings and it has been over interpreted over the time. And uh, people have compared, you know, the apple with different fruits and translators have also kind of um, replaced the word apple with fruits like pomegranate and uh, to check. Mm -hmm and other kind of fruits. Perhaps I'll refer to it later. 
so uh, yeah so one of the fruit is pomegranate because we know that pomegranate seeds or pomegranate has has been even mythically associated with uh, with uh, with the feminine energy so uh, uh, one one of the replacement of apple was pomegranate as far as i remember by one translator and uh, these two fragments they uh, are uh, they are to be understood together uh, as binary oppositions as something that is uh, you know positive and negative something that is one contributing to the other showing that two different sides of the coin okay so this is a very brief uh, textual analysis of the poem now the approaches towards understanding this poem the first approach is body is connected to the landscape so we can give a very eco feminist reading to this poem so i have seen the uh, written here that sexual image melon quince pomegranate apple so these are the replacement of uh, the apple words and again what we have to consider is the color the use of the word uh, the, the use of the word red the color it intensifies uh, certain uh, you know parts of a woman's body uh, it also kind of indicates the female energy of uh, menstruation so red kind of uh, becomes a very prominent word in this poem i'm sorry for the sweet has a uh, has an extra e it is too sweet it seems so sweetness and the location of the apple even sweetness here indicates uh, the sweet temperament of the greek wife that is uh, the greek wife is kind of, kind of expected to be sweet in 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 terms of her married life then the location of the apple is again another important point it is located in a higher level that means how can you achieve how can you stand in that pedestal how can you reach that pedestal by working hard by concentrating on your personality development which sappho helped the girls to uh, you know kind of grow uh, so as i said uh, she had a circle so in this particular circle she focused that her uh, you know pupils would concentrate on personality development they would uh, engage in art and music and refine their stature in the society then women's consciousness of sexuality so what is important to see here is that uh, in this poem the bride is or the bride or the women or the apple the female energy it is in the center so the consciousness of women's energy the women's consciousness of sexuality is kind of emphasized and women is in a protected and secure position in a phallocentric world that is the location of the apple would kind of indicate that how much security is the women having uh, you know in 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 a phallocentric world so some sort of like that then this particular style i'll go back to the poem this style as you see it is called the style of self correction that a woman could have been at the top of the world or she could have had a very um, active role in her married life very active role in her relationship with her partner or as a fe female person herself she could have this level of position but at the same time this woman can also have a position which is as fragile as the wild hyacinth flower so this mode of writing uh, sappho calls the mode of self correction that is you say something and then you kind of erase it and say the other thing it's like it's very uh, post modern in some sense it's like uh, we have novelist giving us two endings uh, to a particular book so it's something like that you come up with two different ways of understanding the poem either take this or take the other so this mode is called self correction uh, self corrective mode the second thing is the translation perspective so the translation perspective becomes very very important in sappho's uh, you know works because uh, we see that there are many radical uh, transformations many uh, you know kind of justifications given uh, over the years to sappho's work so this translation is by rosetti other translators are mary bernard carson and yersiner and others so these are some of the approaches you might go uh, you know you might try to understand more in that direction you might want to uh, understand in uh, the poem from an eco feminist reading that is relating the female body relating the female energy with landscape with geography second is you might understand it from the point of view of sexuality that is uh, connecting every word to um, to a sexual image like the women's body textures the red color the location of the apple you know it might also have some some more indications of sexuality some sexual innuendo somewhere 
and this uh, particular fragment has been called the wedding song so since it's wedding song definitely we uh, see that uh, the apple might also mean uh, that a woman who is kind of in such a position that the groom would have to work very hard to actually uh, kind of woo her into marriage because she has refined herself her taste and she is not uh, the woman who is trampled by the shepherds on the way so there might be uh, if, if if we see uh, from that light from the light of the bride and groom we see that women here occupies the center stage women here uh, the bride here becomes very active and not passive. So these are some sort of ways of looking um, at, the, at this particular fragment from a feminist point of view. And we see the style of self-correction. And again, translation perspective, different ways of understanding the poem. And let's move on to the next slide. What I say here is um, the poetics, that is feminizing the diction. So what do I mean by feminizing the diction? It is uh, including, uh, giving the center stage to uh, the women, uh, womenhood and also women characters. And feminizing the diction means uh, using some colors, using some uh, you know, uh, facial behaviors, using some uh, kind of uh, uh, some words that are very feminine in nature. And also subject matter of, as, as the subject matter of a heroic epic. So in most of Sappho's uh, poems, what we see is that, unlike uh, the other poets like Homer, what she does is that she does not uh, bring in a very epic kind of a character, an athletic, uh, ma masculine you know, person in the front and other characters woven around that person. But rather she has, uh, she, she talks about the marginal character. She rather talks about the characters which are in the sides. So there is one particular fragment of Sappho called fragment number 31. So in this particular fragment, what we see is that um, she's talking about a woman who is sitting with an athletic person. And that athletic man is talking to this woman and the speaker notices the woman. So this idea of noticing the female a person in uh, and, and kind of sidelining and kind of uh, not noticing uh, you know, the uh, the male character, which is traditionally considered to be the hero. Okay, so this kind of gives a twist to her uh, understanding of the world and because of which she is considered to be a feminist, uh, you know, poet. So uh, what is important to note, as I said, is that one girl is a very small fragment. And from that small fragment, we cannot judge the entire writings of Sappho or uh, we cannot see that in this particular two stanzas we have not found her to be very feminist because it's not possible to explain uh, you know or to kind of comprehend an entire corpus of a poet just from two uh, stanzas but in some way or the other we can get a glimpse of how the feminine body or the active role of the bride the position of women in the society kind of has been highlighted by uh, you know this particular uh, fragment then the second uh, thing is that Sappho is well known for writing the choral form of poetry and the monody form of poetry. So uh, the choral form of poetry is where it's basically like a chorus, where you have the audiences large. And the monody form is where, uh, as a form, was adapted to small group performance settings, like the symposium, in which the orderly rotation of speech or song is made. So it's a small group. So this is basically the uh, kind of basic difference between the choral form of poetry and the monody form of poetry. In the choral form, we have a larger audience. And in the monody form, it is mostly a smaller group of people who is the audience. Then we have Sappho's Apithalamia. So if we consider this particular uh, song or this particular poem as a wedding song, it will be one of the Apithalamias that Sappho has written. Comparisons and similes for bride and groom. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, the translators and interpreters. So justifying Sappho has different levels. The first justification is that how far do you think a translation is able to grasp the power of her femininity or the power of her lesbianism, the power of her, uh, you know, uh, strong uh, feminine voice or her erotic energy in her poem. So Anne Carson's, uh, Anne Carson is considered to be one of the most um, you know, uh, latest modern uh, translators of Sappho. You can also buy this book that is available, if not winter, 
which is a very beautiful collection and it mostly kind of uh, highlights the um, the sexual energy the feminine power of sappho and then mary mary, mary bernard has written uh, a translation and these translation i has i have grouped under essence and voice because it justifies more of sappho's uh, poetics in terms of her female you know uh, subjects the subjectivities of um, the uh, uh, the women of her time and the voices then second is justifying the greek language that is uh, i have included three translators here campbell west and miller whose translations justify the uh, you know from greek to english when it is translated it has a like a uh, roughly kind of a similar uh, what uh, a sense or it, it it justifies the language um, the gaps are very less most of the things are not lost in translation something like that so justifies the greek language and then regarding the gaps in her poems she has been discussed by so many people and we have this recent uh, kind of uh, you know sappho um, enthusiast uh, jeanette winters and margaret renault who say that um, how she is emblematic of female artist whose works has been mutilated by male writers critics and scholars so we know that most of her works are not here out of the nine volumes that she wrote only one volume is there and the rest are in fragments uh, the historians the sappho scholars they have been trying over and over again to uh, get hold of her you know uh, lost uh, manuscripts but since it was written in a very different format we uh, then like no uh, we the print culture was not there at that time so it's very difficult to get back or to recover sappho and what they jenet winterson and margaret renault say is that um, sappho sappho's work indicates how a female writer's work has been constantly crushed by the male writers critics scholars mutilated like we have uh, you know um, what uh, the female uh, writers like afra ben and other writers who have Uh, who have given a lot into literature but still it is only now that we are getting to read them and only now we have something like gender studies or you know concentrated studies on women writers so similarly sappho is belongs to one such uh, emblematic female artist whose works have been um, kind of um, annihilated uh, by history and also we uh, we don't know by the masculine you know her masculine interlocutors and uh, counterparts so these are some uh, assumptions rather i would say so um nothing about sappho is very concrete everything is is assumption right from the birth year of her life to the poetics uh, because it's all in fragments to the death of her life and whatever she wrote but it is interesting because uh, for 2000 years she survived and now she is still being Uh, you know constantly read and uh, talked about in uh, gender studies circles in in in, in um, included amongst one so one of the lesbian poets you know but again everything is doubtful uh, regarding her gender identity as well uh, some scholars debate that she might also be a man some scholars debate that uh, she is a lesbian some say that maybe uh, it was only her speaker the voice of her poem uh, the uh, narrator of uh, her di her dialogues who uh, was you know who had a homo erotic kind of a feeling or an identity but some say that she was mostly gender fluid so there are many assumptions regarding her own uh, gender identity but as far as her feminist voice is concerned as far as her you know um bringing out the uh, marginal uh, you know kind of uh, identity the marginal voice of the women of her time is concerned i think things are very clear and that's why uh, she is included in this uh, gender studies uh, add on course of yours so let's move on to the next slide so if you see um i have given here two images one is um, goldberg's book and the other is barnstone's book so you just notice this two cover pages very aptly chosen one is fragments and here you see that the face of sappho is kind of in a glitch kind of a thing this indicates again the fragmentary nature of her work the second uh, cover page if you notice is sappho looking away from the book she is not a front facing sappho that means she has been 
interpreted over, over, over and again. Uh, like most of the mythical characters, like the character of Medusa, who has been interpreted in, uh, in, in Greek mythology, you know, similarly, Sappho as a poet, as a female poet, she deserves uh, some sort of a reading because she lies in fragments. So these two cover pages, I found them very interesting because they kind of add to the uh, mystery of Sappho and why uh, a constant excavation have been, you know, possible in her life. Okay, so let's move on to the next. So this is um, like a brief understanding of what is a sapphic stanza, also known as the sapphic, also called the Pendeka syllabic stanza. Uh, I have mentioned this fragment 31, which is one of her most famous fragments. I would just read this out. He seems to me equals to the god that man, whoever he is who opposes you, sits and listens close to your sweet speaking. He seems to me equal to the gods that man, whoever he is, who opposes you, sits and listens close to your sweet speaking. So there are two people here. One is a man and the other is a woman. So the man might be as equal as God and he is sitting opposite to you. But I am, you know, envious as a speaker, I'm envious that that person is being able to listen to your sweet speaking. That means you are the subject of this particular poem. The, it's not the man who is almost equal to God, the athletic man. It's not him whom I want to focus on, but it's your sweet speaking that you are in focus. So this is one fragment, fragment 31, which kind of brings out her uh, use of, you know, fa her feminist discourse, her use of women's subjects in her uh, po in her poetics. Sapphic stanza, they belong to a aeolic verse form. Like I said, uh, she wrote in the aeolic dialect. So aeolic, it's a part of aeolic verse form. It is unrhymed. Like you see, man, you, close, speaking. These four words, they do not rhyme, unrhymed. It is composed in quantitative meter. Then there are four lines. The first three lines is called the lesser sapphic, and the last line is called the edonic. Okay, so first three line lesser sapphic, last line is called edonic. And this is a particular structure. Let me. Yeah, so this is a structure here. Dash is the long stress syllable. U stands for the short stress syllable, a short, a short unstressed syllable, and X is the free syllable. So this is one structure, but what we have noticed is that uh, this particular structure, which was used even by Catullus and Horace, if we go back to our poem, the structure, it is constantly violated by uh, the translators. And even Dante Gabriel Rossetti, he doesn't follow this structure of sapphic stanza in the translation. So broken in translation, you know, fragmented in translation. Although a fragment still fragmented by the translator, we see that it is very rhymed. First of all, bow somehow now found wound ground. It is rhymed, and suffix stanza is originally not rhymed. It is it is made into three plus three, but suffix stanza is generally four, with the first three line known as the lesser staff suffix and the last line called the adonic. So there is a constant violation of the suffix stanza done by Dante Gabriel Rosati in this poem. So he doesn't follow the structure. OK. So uh, yeah, so that, this is it. Uh, if, if we compare the, you know, uh, the poem, the uh, one girl poem with this particular fragment, fragment 31, what we notice is this uh, kind of lost in translation uh, thing. Uh, how certain translators, they do not pay heed to um, translating uh, you know, a poem in terms of the meter and rhymes. Uh, the same thing happens when you say about haiku translations, uh, sonnet translations, even quatrain translations. So it, it has been even even ghazals, even ghazal translations. Uh, what we see whenever it, they are translated from Urdu to English, they are violated. Like uh, I might give an example of a ghazal that is uh, Faiz Ahmad Faiz. Uh, it is taken from this particular. Uh, it is also used in this particular um, film called Heather. Gulomi Rang Bhare, Badano Bahar Chale. So this is like uh, the uh, you know example of Ghazal's Ghazal. It is always it, it always stands in terms of you know a complete thought. Similarly, Sapphic stanza also stands in terms of complete thought. So 
what uh, you know Amir Kushro, what um, people like Faiz Ahmad Faiz did constantly with a ghazal form, which is a very lyrical form of poetry. The same thing a Greek antiquity poet like Sappho did. So we have to kind of understand everything in terms of relations, uh, not like something Sappho did extraordinary, uh, which uh, nobody did ever in the world. So it's like constantly in parallels, we have to understand that uh, there are many types of, uh, you know, forms of poetry which uh, came into being. And, uh, and, and sapphic stanza is indicative of that, uh, you know, ghazal form, where you have a complete uh, thought in a, a bayat. Bayat is that two lines of the ghazal. Uh, which gives you a complete thought. Similarly, here we have the four lines of the sapphic stanza, which gives us a complete thought. That's why I think the fragments, even though they are in fragments, they seem to be so, uh, you know, kind of closed, structured, and they seem to deliver one imagery in such a, like a refined way that it is possible to interpret and read it. So it's sustained for 2000 years, definitely. Um, let's move to... The, this particular section, it is gender and sexuality. Uh, let me know if I'm on time. If... Okay, we still have some time. So uh, gender and sexuality. Um, Sappho is called the torch bearer of female desire, homoerotic themes, celebration of female beauty. Uh, women in ancient Greece did not have the freedom to embrace a queer identity. And this also applies to the masculine counterparts. They did not have this particular discourse of queerness or discourse of uh, um, a, a very gendered discourse. They did not have. Basically, um, homoerotic relationships were considered or were, were kind of explored, but they were not given the labels and people did not discuss about it openly even during that time. So one of the critiques, Susan Gruber, remarks that Sappho represents all the lost women of genius in literary history, especially all the lesbian artists whose work has been destroyed, sanitized, or heterosexualized. So no matter how homosexual, how kind of, uh, you know, um, female erotic energy had been a kind of included in their work, still they are constantly destroyed. Sanitize. Sanitize is again a word we are very familiar with now. So sanitize and heterosexualize. So annihilating works of Sappho. And then regarding Sappho's lesbianism, is it the speaker of the poem or is it her biographical information? How do we judge um, her lesbianism? So is it the speaker of the poem? Some people say that maybe it's because her speaker is constantly talking about a woman, we kind of feel that Sappho herself was a lesbian. But this is again debatable. Uh, then again, if we consider her biographical information, is there an information about uh, her relationship with other women? She married to a man, but uh, what about her relationship with other women? So these kind of uh, are various ways of looking into her own gender fluidity and sexuality. Then textual reception. Textual reception uh, of Sappho might be done from the point of view of female uh, homoeroticism to heterosexuality to male homoeroticism. So these are some, um, you know, definitive themes that we find in her works. Then it was through Sappho that female homosexuality came to be understood as a distinct sexual orientation and as a distinct sexual set of practices beyond platonic love. That is, uh, before uh, platonic love was given uh, more importance rather than something that uh, kind of had a very sexual kind of uh, approach. Okay, so, um, you know, it is only uh, from Sappho, as far as history goes back, that we know about the exploration of female homosexuality in poetry. Then femininity explored through the trope of landscape, rich in symbolic meaning, subjectivity of judgment on what is beautiful. That is, as I said, there is an eco-feminist reading into Sappho. We understand her words like apple, like the location of the apple, like the tree, you know, the meaning of the apple being associated with the women. We understand, uh, you know, the women landscape relationship in her uh, kind of work. And again, she makes some judgments of subjectivity, like, um, you know, um, what is beautiful, the idea of what is beautiful, the beauty versus ugly discourse which later philosophers like Kant and Hegel, they kind of explored, you know, the what is beautiful, uh, what is female beauty, how can female beauty be achieved, something like that. And Sappho's language is artful and yet flexible. 
elegant and witty. So we find uh, a little bit of wit in this particular fragment, One Girl, uh, which uh, talks about the two different contrasting positions of uh, our women in the society. As, as one who is very unachievable because of her you know, constant importance and active uh, act, active nature in the society, you know her constant importance to her personality development, her skills and art and you know exploration of her life. And the second is uh, the woman who is so fragile that she is kind of trampled by the society instantly in in, in just a second. So these, uh, this is a very witty kind of a discussion in uh, Sappho's language. Then the second thing is literary critiques praised her sublime style. Uh, yes, she her poems have been uh, treated with um, uh, the language of sublimity. Uh, even um, we have Longinus's on sublime, which mentions Sappho. Even Plato in his work Phaedrus, he talks about Sappho. And over the years, uh, people have been talking about Sappho, uh, calling her an inspiration. Uh, Plato calls her the tenth muse. Then uh, Lord Byron, uh, in his child Herol, uh, he he talks about uh, her as dark Sappho. So you know her nature, her sublime nature, the sublime, sublime, or very um, you know kind of heightened uh, vocabulary, heightened language of her writing have been constantly talked about and sometimes also ridiculed. She is ridiculed for that, and she is also ridiculed for her loose morals. And uh, because of her loose morals, she is also given the prostitute status by Seneca and many other, you know, people. And uh, even, even uh, like I said about Ghazals, the Ghazal singer of Persian, uh, Persia, people who uh, were, uh, you know, so women who were engaged in Ghazal singing, they also uh, became, uh, you know, kind of, um, uh, they also uh, attained this morally loose position. Although they were singers, they were poets, but because they went out of their homes, because they went out to discuss poetry on the road, so they attained this prostitute status. Similarly, uh, even uh, Sappho, <clears throat> because she went out and she explored her world, she explored her position, uh, she attained uh, you know, a particular kind of um, a condemned position in the society. But again, there is one thing I mentioned uh, in the first slide that she belonged to an aristocratic family. And maybe because she had a particular uh, background, because she belonged to a very strong, uh, wealthy family. So over the years, her um, her kind of face was also featured in different poetry. Uh, uh, no, sorry, not poetry, pottery. And then um, her face was also a part of many uh, coinages. So coins had her face, and then pottery had her face, and different art kind of uh, had her uh, face engraved into it. So this comes from her aristocratic position. She was one of those uh, women who was chosen to kind of, you know, be there and to be a voice because she had a background. But again, uh, for the other women who, uh, other perhaps women poets who were unacknowledged and we still do not know about them, they always have been condemned as the prostitutes, the, uh, the kind of non-brides, the kind of dangerous and mad women in the society. So... Uh, performing Sappho. Sappho is very readily performed. Uh, for Frankel, Sappho and her followers worship the gods with songs and dances, not only during festive occasions, but also according to sudden personal impulses. So the dances. For Page, another uh, scholar says that Sappho performed her poems informally to her companions. Um, Merkel Bach suggested that nearly all Sappho's poems were intended for a group of girls that she directed. Like I said, she had a circle and she was almost like a headmistress of a particular group of girls. Then West summarized her works as music and songs for public as well as private performance. And Eloni thought there were three groups of poems, ritual songs, poems uh, destined to heterogeneous people, poem addressed to a narrow female audience. So performativity is there in her poems. Poems which are written to be sung, written to be sung to people, People might be the girls of her, uh, of her, of her school or uh, under her tutelage, people on the road, people of particular symposiums. So it is meant to be sung, even ritual songs, wedding songs, performed and sung. And then beauty becomes one of the most important themes in Sappho's works. Even in this particular poem we see, talks about a woman's maturity, her, uh, you know, beauty, the reddening of her uh, body. So beauty is either present absent or remembered. Here we have it is present. 
and then it is the stimulus to desire beauty is considered to be something that gives a stimulus to desire beauty is the object of philosophical sounding reflection in an abstract argument defining the relationship between moral and uh, aesthetical quality then we have the genre the genre of uh, sappho's poems love songs praise poems epic like fragments or song for a god so these are the different kind of genre she used to write in and myths and gods were very uh, common in sappho's works especially she was very much influenced by the life of aphrodite and even uh, you know achilles and uh, even her death like i said have been compared to the plunge of aphrodite into a lover who would never respond back so aphrodite constantly comes in the idea of beauty the idea of apple the idea of love you know constantly comes into uh, play in sappho's works then sappho is one of the original authors of a cultural lexicon able to articulate the connection between sight memory beauty and desire so cultural lexicon that is cultural lexicon as in uh, certain words that captures culture and in sappho's work what we see is that there is a diction there is a choice of words the vocabulary they kind of try to capture the sight the memory the social context uh the position of women in the society if women were allowed to go outside if women were you know uh, treated well by their husbands and how they were trained to uh, kind of operate in the society so kind of things like that okay yeah. so uh, this is it i would end with one particular note that is um, you know sappho as a riddler so what we see is that sappho is a riddler these particular fragments like one girl and uh, fragment number 31 and other fragments it kind of um, it kind of brings sappho to us as a riddler a person who is asking a question and when she ask a question to you and to her male uh, counterpart to her male uh, you know uh, uh, what audience or or even female audience as a riddler she attains a very heightened position that means i'm asking you a question i know the answer but you don't know it so i'm the person who would answer you so this kind of challenges the male interlocutors of her time this challenges uh, the uh, phallocentric world this challenges all the assumptions you have about me so this kind of um, the riddling position the riddler's position uh, makes sappho very threatening at times to a particular section of the society so she has instilled a lot of fears instilled a lot of questions and she has been constantly uh, you know imitated uh, ventriloquized then uh, you know feared by people and interpreted over interpreted over time so it it kind of gets um, it gets almost impossible sometimes to reach to the real sappho and 2000 years is a very long time if you look at history uh, literary history historical evidences you know of libraries and uh, different you know uh, different scholars who have been working on her constantly what we see is that uh, she is a different person in a different book translator for one translator she might have been uh, just a woman for another translator she might have been a prostitute for another kind of a translator she would be just a historical fragment we know about okay so different positions and similarly her poems um, you know we do not have one interpretation to her poems like her fragments we can go for many fold interpretation on and on the apple changes with the pomegranate in in one girl and it constantly is kind of replaced by different fruits different uh, things so we can read it in 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 many ways and it is up to the reader how to read it to uh, read it as a wedding song to read a one girl as uh, something that is dedicated to aphrodite to read one girl as uh, the condition the position of a uh, woman in her uh, society or to ring one girl as a dedicated poem to one of the women uh, or perhaps a pupil who worked under her who was uh, staying under her tutelage so you know different different manifold interpretation and it is a very short poem but um, and also in internet very less evidence have been uh, you know i i found really less materials on one girl but uh, i would definitely share whatever i got i got some uh, beautiful books 
which uh, you know contributes a lot to uh, the you know to the penmanship of Sappho and to the uh, craftsmanship of Sappho and her contemporaries. So I would share that materials and even this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Definitely, I'll share with you people so that uh, you can get an overview of what we talked about. So I think uh, that will be all from me. Uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your wonderful and insightful uh, lecture. Um, and next, uh, we have the next procedure we have is uh, question and answer session. So the session is now opened for all. If students or if participants have any questions, please, uh, or you are encouraged to ask a question now, or not only in, you know, and not only queries and questions, but also discussions as well. Please feel free to ask any question, even uh, there is any doubt in the textual analysis of the poem, perhaps, or anything. Please go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, we will wait for some time. So the okay, students. Sure, uh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. sure. And I would like to say that I'll share all the materials, also some reading materials with you people. So um, I'll mail it to you so that everything is, you know, in your hand to go ahead with uh, understanding Sappho more. Um, like I am not a Sappho scholar, but uh, definitely I'm interested in uh, the feminist and the gender perspective of Sappho and the, uh, you know, uh, discussions of Sappho's, uh, you know, uh, kind of. Uh, the, the body discourse basically since i work on uh, bodies so uh, how the women's beauty have been constantly uh, you know talked about how uh, she perceives a woman before perceiving a man some sort of questions about beauty ugly kind of things so this is how i see sappho but definitely i would like to know more perspectives of from, from you if there is any. Ma'am, you already have a question. Uh, sorry, sorry, my microphone was off. Yeah. I saw Seema Gogoi saying that, ma'am, can we interpret Sappho's poems from a creature feminine perspective? Definitely. This is a very uh, good question, Seema. Uh, a creature feminine perspective, why not? Writing um, through the body, you know, from the body, about the body. That is what a creature feminism is all about. And it would be amazing to kind of discover, you know, Sappho through the creature feminine perspectives. How she is writing, you know, through the body. Her own gender fluidity, the gender fluidity of her, uh, you know, uh, the, of the speakers of her poem. Writing about the body. Okay, writing about the body and writing in a very feminist, uh, feminist diction. Feminist diction as in use of words which are very female in nature. Like uh, one one translator, uh, uh, she kind of talked more about the maternal perspective of Sappho, like the maternal symbolisms of Sappho, how she talks about the pregnant women. She talks about the uh, body of a woman changing, you know, talks about body fluids. So things like that. Definitely uh, writing through the body, about the body, you know, and uh, using a very female uh, kind of uh, language, female vocabulary, female choice of words would be amazing to interpret, um, you know, Sappho as. This is a very good point. Thank you, Seema. Then uh, we will move to Madhurjo. Okay, thank you. Madhurjo has just a comment, a wonderful, thank you, Madhurjo. Um, so, okay, thank you, thank you. Yes, I hope so. You liked it. 
I uh, perhaps missed out on this equature feminist uh, perspective thing. I talked more about the landscape, uh, landscape, and eco, -femi eco feminist, um, you know, perspective, because this particular fragment has more of an eco feminist perspective. But Seema would like to go ahead with uh, um, some other fragments, or maybe even if you talk about this particular fragment, one girl, you can bring in reference from some other fragments so that you can properly argue your point that how, what do you mean by e creature feminism in Sappho? Because this one girl doesn't really have much to say except for the use of the color red, except for certain, certain bits here and there. But it is not a very sexual, uh, uh, erotic, or maybe homosexual kind of a poem as such. But uh, if you bring along some other poems, some other fragments, it will substantiate as a very good point, the creature feminism. Anything else? Can you tell me the significance of Hayakin flower and purple? OK. Basically, the Haya, uh, Hayasan flower is, is purple in color. Uh, purple, purple. The, Definitely, I missed out on this indication of the color purple. I think the color purple here is very direct in the sense that uh, the Hayakin flower is purple in color. I, I, I read in like that. But uh, there might be some other significance. Uh, Jeannie, I will have to perhaps look more into this particular question because I did not think why the word purple is here. Yeah, like we say, said red, red might indicate something you know, related to the women's body, the women's uh, crevices, or maybe uh, uh, what the, the maternal color, red. But Hayakin flower is purple. Also, one thing is that purple is associated with something, uh, the mood of melancholy. That is one thing. So maybe this mood of melancholy, the mood of, uh, it, it's, it's not a very positive word, purple. Purple stands somewhere uh, between, uh, you know, black, blue, somewhere between, before reaching black and blue. So it's a melancholy color. So if a woman is crushed down, she is almost on the verge of death. She is uh, kind of annihilated by the society. What happens? She becomes melancholy or she is almost in the process of dying, death. So this might be one kind of um, you know interpretation of the word purple. Association with melancholy, association with possible uh, annihilation, possible death, possible kind of you know um, a breakdown or whatever. Anything else? Please comment. Feel free to comment. We're just discussing. Anything, even even a simple, you know, silly question would also do. Just go ahead. Every question is so important. Okay. Can you tell me the significance of apple? Okay. So significance of apple. Like I said, apple, it might mean the woman. Apple might mean the woman's fertility, okay? It might mean, uh, you know, uh, everything associated with womanhood, every energy that is associated with womanhood. So if an apple grows on a tree, suppose this is a tree and the apple is on top of the tree, that means a woman's energy, a woman's, uh, you know, perspectives, her body is in such a level that is very unachievable which anybody uh, would not like to come and pluck and, you know, crush it and go away. So it means that you have kind of attained that level of superiority in terms of your being as a woman, that um, kind of, you know, it, it, it becomes impossible almost for the pluckers to easily pluck that apple. So apple here means, I'm also reminded of the infamous apple of Eden. Yes, definitely, Madhurja, a symbol of forbidden knowledge. Yes. So. Uh, the apple is associated with the forbidden apple of Eden. And also many, uh, you know, uh, there is a book which I am working on in my PhD thesis. It's called The Passion of New Eve. That is, you know, how we all want to be that new Eve and how we all uh, want to kind of, you know, eat that forbidden fruit again and again. So this is like, uh, you know, going back to being the Eden, uh, uh, going back to being the Eve, which is um, kind of very much, under the shadow of Adam always. Yeah, so we want to be the new Eve. We don't want to be behind Adam. We don't want to be, um, you know, a, a, a person who is created from the body of Adam uh, and not directly coming, uh, her lineage directly coming from God. So it's like um, being the new Eve. So perhaps this is what Sappho wanted to be, you know, wanted to talk about while signifying the apple. Yeah, this might be the case. 
Anything else? Thank you, Ankita. I hope uh, my uh, you know talk was clear enough. And if there is any question, please uh, like get back to me. I'll perhaps share my email ID here. If you have any question, please drop an email. If you are not being able to uh, question here, so I'll, I'll happily uh, answer back. I think uh, that will be done, I suppose so. Yes, yes, yes. The sign of no more questions uh, indicates that uh, today's lecture is quite clear and students have already, or participants have uh, already got the concept of this point longer. And if no more questions, then we will next move to the next uh, uh, stage that is a uh, word of thanks. So I would like to uh, hand over this program to Dr. Dipajati Bora for the word of thanks. Uh, thank you, Mongol. I was listening a bit to Zorna's lecture, uh, and I think that is very, very stimulating, deeply insightful. And <clears throat> I hope that our student actually <laughs> Uh, learned a lot from this lecture and you know how she you know uh, in explored in in depth about various dimensions of Sepho's poem from structural point of view or thematic point of view or various kind of dimension of gender theory so thank you zorna madam again for this very very insightful lecture thank you and thank you, sir. also i'd like to thank all the participants who listen very attentively to mm's deliberation and uh, <clears throat> not <clears throat> also, uh, I thank our ASOD Dr. Deepa Hukon Borua for encouraging us to provide this kind of platform for uh, the speakers as well as the you know audience. Uh, and I hope that uh, and in I uh, would also like to meet Zorna Mem in the next uh, you know possible kind of adventure. And uh, <clears throat> uh, mm, I'll I would like to hand over to Mongol Sinongpar for the next program. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the word of thanks. And now we don't have much more, just an announcement. Tomorrow we have a screening screening of the film, Call Me by a Name at eleven o'clock. So all the participants of a gender course and on gender course are requested to be there at hall number eight for the screening of the film. Call me by your name. Remember, it's 11 a.m. tomorrow. That's all for today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Thank you.